Hey, I'm Roger Coons. I'm a geologist, naturalist, and a sustainologist. I uh, run a small sustainability company, and tonight I'm speaking at the Ephraim Historical Foundation, part of their History Speaks. And the history tonight is geologic, natural history, and all about us. And I've got a couple books if you uh, like to talk. The first one is The Sound of a Car Starting Up. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, first, the first one is called Didn't See That Coming, and it's about the wanders around the planet. And uh, as a geologist working on all the continents except Antarctica, and the second one is Dolphin Mimicry, which I wrote on a ship in the South Atlantic off the coast of Namibia, and it's about a dolphin and a guy, and what that's all about to have a friend like a dolphin. So, two books, and uh, this fall, Escarpment, the natural history of Door County in eastern Wisconsin, starting at 4.55 billion years ago and going 200 years into the future. I'm Roger Coons, and I hope you enjoy all these things. It's just a whole lot of fun. Great. And then uh, where can you buy the uh, two books, and what's their suggested retail price? The books are available on musictoearspress.com. And uh, that is music, M-U-S-I-C, uh, T-O-E-A-R-S-P-R-E-S-S -S dot com. And uh, it's about 20 bucks plus shipping or 19 bucks if you buy it here. And it's uh, 10 bucks for that one. Including the author's signature? Uh, author's signature. And uh, if you want me to speak at one of your things, just give me a call. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Looking you. Forward. Great. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. I am going to talk without the mic. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, welcome to a new season of Disney Speaks. I just learned today from Paul Burton we're celebrating the 25th anniversary. What a remarkable achievement. And this evening's lineup is just goes along with the same trend that's, that's been going on here for all those years. It's a terrific program this year. Next week, George Larson will be talking about growing up in Ephraim, his father running the first filling station here in Ephraim. He was still talking about it. The week after, Dennis Sickley will be talking about his experiences in the fishing business, which he and his family have done for the entire life. And finally, to wrap up on the 28th, the last Tuesday in July, a great program, information I think that we all need to know, learn more about, which is the role that the Native Americans in this area played in the Civil War. It should be very interesting. A great lineup. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to encourage you to um, come to our exhibit at the Ethan Foundation for the Anderson Barn this year. The title of it is William Bernhardt Connecting the Dots. It's about our local renowned architect, William Bernhardt. We go through his life, his experiences, his background, and what made him come to Ephraim and become the architect that he was here, living here for the last 25 years of his life. Designing some of the remarkable and iconic buildings that you may be familiar with, the fire station, it's now a museum. The building you're sitting in, although his original design was much more elaborate than what we're sitting in now, but nonetheless, the style is very, very much so we go through his life and bring you up to the point where he was here and he comes designing some of the buildings here. So please uh, plan to come. You know, these events really talk about the people, places, and events that comprise our community. And they talk about events over the last 100 years, maybe 200 years. <coughs> Tonight, 
we're going to hear about events that went on perhaps millions of years ago, two, three hundred million years ago. <coughs> so it's a combination of events and places that brings us here to this uh, talk tonight. Roger Kuhn does wear many hats. tell you some, a, a short a short story of course I'm a geologist so uh, as, as I mentioned to the guys back there um, I hope you brought your breakfast because it's only a seven hour talk and you know uh, Paul told me the breakfast weren't provided so uh, the thing is uh, I got here I, I've been coming up to Door County since I was a kid clamoring around in the stone fences and my folks had a cottage in Bailey's Harbor out by the lighthouse and it was a lot of fun and then they moved up here about 25, 30 years ago. Some of you might have known my dad. He did New Month magazine and stuff like that. And um, my mom is just, uh, I would say, the, an amateur anthropologist historian. She's into everything. And uh, so uh, I got here and started having fun. And then having left Africa, uh, I realized that in order to stay in Door County, you got to have three jobs. <laughs> so I had a whole bunch, you know how it is, a whole bunch of jobs. So one day my sister Jeannie, who has the Lost Moth Gallery down in Egg Harbor, she says, you got this phone call. They, somebody wants to give you a, have you be the keynote speaker at a meeting. And I'm going, all right. And she says, it's the Wisconsin Weapons Association. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not going to call them back. That's all right. Nothing against it, it's just that I don't know what I would say. But no, they're very insistent. They said they knew about your work, and they knew about your, your, your place up here, everything, and, and, and they really want you to talk. So I, uh, now I'm curious, right? So I dial the phone, or you know, and this beautiful voice answers, hello, the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. <laughs> So, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen here in Dark County, uh, which brings me to the next thing. Now, this is a historical society, and as many of you know, 
Jackson Pollock spends his summers up here for a couple of years, right? You guys know that? It's, it's amazing. And I was surprised as well because I didn't actually know this until I was rummaging in the attic one day. And I, I just, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. There was, there was actually a, a Jackson Pollock. <laughs> Look at that. It says it right there. It says, what is this? I mean, and, you know, he was a fractal painter. Do you guys know what that means? It's mathematical. Self-similarity on every scale. The way nature works. And he started doing all this fractal stuff, and he perfectly describes the geology of Door County. So you've got to be very careful with these things you find in the attic, you know. <laughs> Even more surprised, snuggled under it with a couple nests, mice nests on top of it, was this thing that I also found. Now, uh, you probably recognize this as, as a Monet. <laughs> Uh, and Monet spent one summer up here. He was on a retreat. I think he was up at the clearing. And uh, so what he did is he spent his whole summer trying to capture the Niagara Escarp. And as you can see, he got it. I think this is just a, a sketch, probably something he would have put in his notebook. Never got a chance to finish it. You know, everything in Paris was calling and so on and so on. You know how it is, right? So again, uh, there's some great art in nature. And these guys, again, you got to be very careful with these things. So the thing about Door County is when we try to understand our history, I think we actually have to go back to day one. Now, that's 4.55 billion years ago. That's a ways. And so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go all the way back there. I'm just going to go back about a billion, maybe a billion and a half years. And then we're going to kind of lollygag through various you know, periods and times and stuff like this and try to understand what's under our feet, why it's here. Because what's under our feet defines our bays, defines the kind of building stone we use, defines what kind of forests we have, and what kind of crops we can grow. And I think this is really fun, because you just never know what's going to come out of the ground. So I'm going to start this little thing here. And we can bring the lights down a little bit, but not all the way. If you can see that, OK. So the Niagara Escarpment started with water. This was an ocean way back before the Niagara Escarpment was even a dream. And then what we see, the reoccurring story, is water water, 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 and now we got the Great Lakes, right? And the story is continuing in the water as we'll end on today because is this a finite or an infinite resource, right? We need this water, and this is pretty important. It really defines our peninsula, which is actually an island because they blasted the channels from in Sturgeon Bay. So I know someday we'll have a name for the island and we'll come up with something kind of creative. So Door County, well, let's go back in time a bit. Let's follow this river that takes us back in time and see if we can understand why the peninsula is here, why the escarpment is here, why the bays are they are. This is the, this is the Niagara Escarpment uh, flying on a kind of bumpy day. But uh, it's a very distinctive cliff that defines the western shore of the Door Peninsula. If you're on the quiet side, the east side, that's not the escarpment. Only here, even though they try to claim it a couple times. So you guys have to be a little protective about that. I mean, Ephraim needs this escarpment, right? OK, so it's in red there. And I'm going to focus that, I think. All right. So way back, let's go back. We have this mass underneath us that was in brown, now green, now yellow. These are the Precambrian paleocontinents that smashed in to form what we call the craton underneath us. This is like building a foundation. It then was pushed up into mountains that were as high as the Himalayas. Amazing mountains that weathered down over 200 million years. 
and created a series of rivers and drainages. We see the rocks that resulted from this formation. Then this happened. We had a rift, just like the East African rift. It looked like this, lava erupting from a crack in the earth. This is really important because this created a rock type that is so dense that when it started to sink into the crust, it created what would one day be the Michigan Basin. So without this type of lava a billion years ago, we would not have the basin that created the Dolomites that are the backbone to the peninsula. So we, this is Kilauea, and that's kind of what it looked like. And the terrain back then, uh, on a field trip we took back, back to the Proterozoic, this is what it looked like. There were no plants on the land, and there was only algae in the water. And there you can see a map of the Great Lakes. And you can see that rift goes all the way under the state of Michigan. And it goes all the way down through the central part of the country. And then something else slammed into this continent and created mountains called the Grenville Mountains. These things were like the Himalayas. They were 25, 28, 30, 35,000 feet high. They were amazing. And there's no plants to hold them up to keep the soil from eroding. So every time it rained, the rivers were chocolate brown and rushing and filling full of gravel, just as I've drawn here in this very simple sketch kind of thing. And these resulting sediments turned into rocks that we see way below us, 1,000, 2,000 feet down. Okay? Eventually, those mountains actually eroded away. And then an amazing thing happened. Ice came from the South Pole, because we're south of the equator here. So we're upside down, and it looked like this. The first ice age here was 800 million years ago. Okay, And it's called Snowball Earth. It was so extensive that it actually had ice probably down to about 23 degrees latitude north and south, which is the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. That was so cold, we call it the frozen Earth model, the snowball event. And this basically took life, which was very happily evolving, and stopped it. It's like putting everything into the deep freeze. And this went on for a couple hundred million years, where life was basically stopped. And so you can see the glaciers coming down from the north, these huge ice sheets, amazing ice sheets, even freezing much of the oceans. So life stopped. It was kind of, let's just slow down here and let's let the Earth think about what, it, what it's going to do. Because someday it's going to make you, and they're going to say, that was a good idea. <laughs> so this is when they were thinking about that. Okay. Then everything thought out we had this bloom of early life. Those are uh, stromatolites, algae mounds, and the cladophora we see along the shore of the lake now is very much like the stuff that was back then. And these weird life forms lived in these ancient seas. This is pre-Cambrian. This is before most of the life on the planet. It's the experimental stage. It's like you putting a a tub of cottage cheese in your refrigerator for three months while you're away. What's it gonna look like? It's gonna look like this, okay? And so what we're doing here is we're experimenting with multicellular life. That happened right here, okay? And all around the world, we see these weird fossils of life that didn't have any bones, didn't have any shells, anything like that. So we make this construct. This is the basement. Okay, now we're going to start putting stuff on it. We're going to put the icing on the cake. And so what starts happening is we have these river systems that open up and allow an ocean, a sea, to come in. Because remember those, that rift rock is so dense, it's sinking down and making kind of like a saucer pit into the crust of the earth. And the ocean water floods into here, and then it drains back. And then we have impacts and volcanoes and things like this dropping bits of ash, dropping bits of debris, and we can see this in the rocks down in Green Bay in the Ordovician sequence down at Wekwiak Falls. The ocean, the sea, the, the uh, Michigan Basin was 
extensive and non-extensive, and we're going to talk about karst in a little bit. There was even a karst event 450 million years ago here, way before there was even the Niagara series dolomite. So with this amazing influx, and this great thing coming in is ash from volcanics out in the old Appalachians way back in time. And so much uh, weathering even occurred that we made iron deposits here, okay? So right at the top of the Ordovician, there was another ice age. And this created a mass extinction of about 50% of the species on the planet. It took about a million years to recover, and we came into the Silurian, and coral reefs took off. Before that time, there were really no coral reefs. This is a new invention. I mean, they're, they're colonial corals and, and weird little crustaceans and stuff, and these are actual photographs from the, the Silurian. We went back there last week, Paul and I, and we, you know, he put on his scuba gear, and off we went. And so you can see the fossils are gray or buff colored. Here's a modern equivalent of a trilobite. And that's what it looks like <laughs> in a fossil record. When you think of these fossils that you see in your stone fences and in the walls and in, in, the, in the, uh, the piers out into the water, think of these photos, these colors. These were vibrant, these were alive, they were beautiful. They were amazing as a pileated woodpecker. Okay, just beautiful animals. This gray thing here, I mean, that's what it looked like. That's what it looked like. So make these things alive in your mind. And this is what we see today. We see fossils of these kind of guys, these you know, little, little cephalopod type critters and everything. In fact, there's a really good one down on the rocks by the dock here. And this is what one of them looks like here. So the Niagara escarpment in the red, and the blue areas ended up being most of the seas, very much like the Caribbean or the Mediterranean, okay? And in those basins, sometimes the water got so shallow and the days so hot that we made salt deposits, of which there are many in Michigan at this time. The yellow area is the salt, and then reef complexes, when the water deepened, rimmed these areas of the basin center. So you can see the reef systems were all through the upper Midwest and the East. And again, when we go back into those rocks and look at the fossils, we see these amazing life forms that are truly magnificent, bryozoan. This is what the reef looked like. This is the, that was the Bermuda area. And so you have this spectacular array of coral reefs everywhere. These are pentamerids, my favorite fossil up here. And they actually had little light sensory organs in them and could flee from some of their predators. <laughs> this is a cephalopod, very much like this guy, except with a hard shell. Look at his eye, he's saying, hey, what, I'm really old. <laughs> and so you can see, amazing thing. Now flying in, I took this picture out of the window, and um, <laughs> you can see the Great Lakes. And you can see domes and the Michigan Basin in green, and there are other green basins. Those are the Appalachians. Those are volcanic way, way back, okay? So in the brick pattern is where all the ocean was depositing the coral. And so we can see why the Niagara Escarpment is where it is, because it's like the rim of a saucer that has been tipped up as that saucer deepened. Do you get that? Very important concept. Oh my God, can you imagine swimming in there? You would just be eating seafood, by the way. Uh, your trilobite was very good and the bully base was spectacular. But, you know, there's nothing but a little bit of slime on the shoreline. On the land, there's virtually no life until we get to the end of this coral reef time. This is the Great Barrier Reef. There's one of the guys floating around. The Great Barrier Reef has over eight thousand marine species. In my time studying these rocks, I found about 50 to 100 species. Think of the diversity difference. That's also telling you there are a lot of species we've never found fossils of. So geology is kind of like groping in the dark with a blindfold, with your feet tied, going uphill in a sandstorm on a dark night. 
-hmm. It's a very easy career to get into. <laughs> so these coral reefs, just spectacular. This one out at Northport Park, Newport Park, uh, just spectacular arrays of corals. The modern corals in those photographs are different than these colonial corals like that one. Now the colonial corals, all the corals decided to get together and make a hard series of houses. They're the first condominiums in Door County. Okay, and you're probably thinking, wish I would have bought my property then. But again, if you don't like seafood, forget about it. So it, there's Door County, and we had reefs that extended from there all the way towards Michigan and into Michigan, depending on what the water levels were of that sea. When the water level was high, it pushed the reefs inland to Wisconsin. When it was low, otherwise. So we see these amazing critters roaming around here and again, experimenting with life, getting tough, okay? And they lasted a couple hundred million years. An amazing time right here. These organisms made the dolomite that is now the Niagara series. Were there dinosaurs in Wisconsin? Anybody think so? One, two, you get a free CD. Okay, well, there they are, there they are. Hey, you know, you know there were dinosaurs here, right? Man, I mean, this is what it looked like here. This was above the seawater, so there were dinosaurs because we see them out east, out west, into the south. Look at all that land over Wisconsin on this map. Of course there were dinosaurs here. But because it was land, it was always eroding. So those fossils, like this one my son found, this is a rib of a torosaur in Montana. Uh, we know he was just down the street. So he would have walked over here. Who wouldn't? It's a vacation place. <laughs> and when, when that time was here in Wisconsin, this is what Wisconsin looked like. We see dinosaur footprints east and south. Here I am being chased by one. And so it's just kind of amazing that in the redwood forests that lived here, we had incredibly complex habitats. And, and uh, I was trying to do a Cretaceous thing and something happened when I was at, back in the Cretaceous not too long ago. It was, it was, my son was filming me and everything was going just fine. And then he yelled T-Rex and you know, it, it, it was a tough day. I mean, you just, what are you gonna do? You know, you gotta take off. But there were dinosaurs here and this is what an average day in Door County would have looked like, okay? So, you know, you gotta be able to run about 45 miles an hour to outrun a velociraptor. <coughs> Everything ends. So why aren't the dinosaurs here? Well, we find their bones everywhere in the world. But about 65 million years ago, in what would be India, there was a massive volcanic eruption. Massive. It went on for five million years. And then these things started falling out of the sky. Asteroids. That's the biggest one. And it was a typical day in the late Cretaceous. The dinosaurs were having a good time. And what are you going to do, right? So what happened was we had five million years of volcanism that basically turned the atmosphere into a toxic mess. You couldn't breathe it. And we lost about 60, 70% the species on Earth in that time. And those asteroids popped in right at the end between the red Cretaceous and the green tertiary and finished it off, all right? It wasn't one event. It was a conglomeration of overlapping things. This is another mass extinction. We learn from this. When those asteroids hit, the yellow area on this map is where the fires ranged across the planet from those impacts. The planet caught fire. Right here, if, you were, if it happened right today, just a couple minutes, a couple seconds after the impact, we would have felt a magnitude 10 earthquake. Within a couple days, we would have been hit by these tsunamis from those two impacts. And the one north of Chickaloo, you can see, came all the way up into the interior. It actually came through Ephraim, a wall of water about 130 feet high from the Gulf of Mexico. That happened here. Man, can you imagine? Bad day. <laughs> it took the Earth a million years to recover from that event. A million years to recover.
So when we talk about sensitive habitats, well, it takes a while to recover. Let's remember that when we start thinking about what's going on. But that was the dawn of the mammals. Huge herds across here, lush forests during the wet times, savannas during the mid-dry times, and even dusty times when it was a bit drier still, okay? And so we had all of those amazing tertiary giant animals, everything from the saber-toothed cats on up to the mammoths. And then another ice age started two million years ago. Two million years. Now this is the third one here, right? And that thing popped in and covered the whole of the upper Midwest and Northern Europe and a bit of Russia. And it stuck around and this is what the glaciers look like. My son and I have been doing some global warming research on Iceland. This is where this is. And this is a very rapidly melting glacier, which is what happened about 12,800 years ago. Something happened. That area off in the background is a kettle moraine being actually made, just like the state park south of us. The water running off of these glaciers is intense. And we see these amazing accumulation of what would be till, that dirty stuff on the ice is actually all the silt and the sand and the clay that's in the ice accumulating on top as the thing melts down. So you can see that big ice sheet off in the background. You can see a lagoon in the foreground. And you can see this till and the moraine, that hill back there. And if you go down to the shore, this is crushed rock, the consistency of flour that's suspended in the water. And we see this in the uh, bog and fen sediments at the bottom of these bogs and fens. So we know that happened here as well. The third glaciation. Wasn't big enough to create a huge extinction, but where are all the mammoths? You know that old folk song? Where have all the mammoths gone? <laughs> well, you know, I, I know you're too young for that, but your dad will teach you, okay? Okay, sure, and grandpa and everything. So the river system developed south of this, and 28,000 years ago, the ice had pushed all of our ecosystems south. There was boreal forest in Tennessee, okay? So all of these systems were compressed like an accordion south, and then as the ice melted back, they followed it back. So how fast does a maple tree walk? Well, it turns out that because this happened hundreds of times, we know that the forest could advance and recover about the equivalent of a football field a year. Now, with the global warming that's happening, we're asking them to do that in about, they're at, we're asking them to do about 3,000 feet a year. And they haven't evolved to this, so this is creating a bit of a dilemma. So we have these mammoths, and we see fossils of them all around there, and then 12,800 years ago, about a night like tonight, a comet came screaming out of the sky, and it hit the ice sheet, the Laurentian ice sheet, which was 7,000 feet thick over Hudson Bay. And the mammoths are going, we heard about this. The Clovis people that had migrated across Asia and Russia and across the Bering Strait and populated the, the North American and South American continents over a 30,000 year period, looked up, dependent on these megafauna, and saw the thing impact up in Canada, and then there was so much kinetic energy that it set the forests on fire all the way around that ice sheet. And it, that's day one for global warming for me. 12,800 years ago, a comet fell out of the sky, and guess what? We don't see those megafauna anymore, and the Clovis culture vanished. They were so fragmented that they had to move and make new tribes and met up with other tribes elsewhere in the Americas. It's an amazing story. Well, with all that water around, we made a thing called karst, K-A-R-S-T, basically Swiss cheese in the rock. We appropriately are living on Swiss cheese, right? I mean, Wisconsin, Swiss cheese. This karst is basically caves and collapsed sinkholes in the ground. Now, this is south of France on uh, St. Circuit of in the Lot River, and you can see huge karst pillars, but how do you make this stuff? So let's go back in time again. We're gonna go back to that Silurian Ocean, and we're gonna make this dolomite that's here. Well, we had a little sea with critters floating in it, and that 
created a, an area where we could deposit a lot of the calcium carbonate from the coral shell and the shells and so on and so forth. Eventually, that got buried, and as it got buried deeper and deeper, as the Michigan Basin sank, it made it and turned it into limestone and dolomite. On top of that then, as it was uplifted, whole new habitats developed. Forests, all sorts of dinosaurs, all sorts of things, okay? And the cracks in the rock developed, and surface water from rivers and rain dribbled into there and established a thing called a water table in the light blue. Well, all of those connectivities started dissolving away the rocks, and the caves are shown in the dark color here, okay? So this dissolves out that dolomite, <coughs> and it makes this karst feature, because some of the caves cave in, and you get a sinkhole, kind of like an investment in 2008. And so you've got this holy Swiss cheese ground. This is karst. This is how you make karst. And it was made here in the last 12,000 years, but it was also made in between the glacial advances and then sometimes scraped off. And it was also made hundreds of millions of years earlier as well. So where you have these things, the dolomites and the limestones, you'll get this terrain like that. And that's what Wisconsin, what eastern Wisconsin, especially up here, looked like. The glacier came in, scraped off all those pillars, filled up a lot of the caves with sediment, and so when you go caving in Horseshoe Bay Cave, you're gonna get really muddy and stuck, okay? So uh, what we can see, though, is these fractures that guided the formation of the caves and the karst. The fractures, like, like uh, um, Jackson Pollock had painted, form this nice symmetry, this kind of X shape called a dihedral or a conjugate set. So the rock fractures this way and this way, there's the 60, 70 degree angle over here, and the water goes down there. And once the water starts dissolving the dolomite, more water can get in and you dissolve more of it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you make a cave. Why is that important? You see those bays? Okay. Well, these bays line up with fractures. I started doing this map 35 years ago. And something dawned on me one day I was actually in Ephraim, and I was having breakfast, and I said, bays are all symmetrical. See these fractures? See how there's a symmetry, a repetitive you know, angle, similar angle? I'm gonna show you some more scales. See if we step back, you see that you know, X shape all over? That's why it's such great building stone. It's flat, and it's broken into nice bite-sized bits. If you look in a field during the drought, look at those lines. Those are the fractures, they have water in them. So the plants grow bigger. You fly over them, those are the fractures. The plants are taking the water out of the fractures. And look at the water going into these fractures. These are waterways that dissolve the dolomite to make the karst terrain, and also make a lot of the structure we see on the Niagara dolomite. So this is the, this is the Niagara dolomite on the escarpment, and we can see the red line up at top is the escarpment, but there's breaks in it, like right here, right? This bay itself. That bay connects with what? The ridges sanctuary. You guys are connected to the other side of the peninsula. You didn't know that, did you? You said, oh, we don't talk to them over there. <laughs> oh, the geology does. And so it connects. And those are our lowlands, often our wetlands. And so when somebody like the land trust first tried to get land, they could only get the wetlands because nobody could farm them or build on them. And these are actually defined by structures. The ridge of sanctuary itself is a little different, but as we fly over it, we can see our bay here, and you can see Moonlight Bay and uh, Bailey's Harbor, and that is a fracture zone progressing across the peninsula. That's why we have breaks in the Niagara Escarpment. So what are these things? These things are ancient river valleys that were here before Green Bay was here. There used to be mountains up in northern Wisconsin, when we look at the base of the uh, uh, ridges, we see a deep, deep valley. This is the Anape, another very straight northwest trending river, right? So what we have is river systems that formed along these fractures, draining the continental mass up to the northwest and creating huge valleys that have since been cut off. 
by the glaciation. So, how wide is the Niagara, or the Niagara Escarpment's zone of influence? Can you build right on the edge of it and say, I'm not hurting anything? Or do you have to be conscious of the environment 10 feet back, 100 feet back, 1,000 feet back? What is it? How do we know? Well, this is a map of the ecosystems from the alkaline shore, the talus, the algific zone, the vertical face, and the forest on top. This is the algific zone, very wet at the base of the cliff. Lots of moss. This has like a Pleistocene type environment, an ice age environment. And look at that little guy. That snail is one of six species that's a Pleistocene or ice age carryover. It thinks it's in Canada. It's looking for gravy on that moss. That's the Canadians, eh? And so, and way up on top in the forest, we have thin soils. We have alvars and vernal pools up there. The vertical face is our oldest forest in Wisconsin right now. Some of those cedars in Peninsula State Park are 800 years old. The oldest cedar I have seen is on the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario, and it was 1,850 years old and it was this big around, that big around. It put all of its energy into growing roots to hang on. So when we look at the Niagara Escarpment, look at the connectivity. Remember that karst and the sinkholes and the caves? You can be all the way in the middle of the county and still be connected with the escarpment here. And that's because of these fractures and the caves and this thing whistles when the wind blows. It's just an amazing hole. It's just like Swiss cheese. So in some places, as we get south of Egg Harbor, we have more of a you know, flat slope out to the bay. And so we have, a, we have that shale underneath that makes the escarpment. <clears throat> but again, all of that area is connected. I made these diagrams for the county board and for some of the committees because they were thought they could cut the trees within 10 feet of the edge of the cliff, and that would be fine. And uh, that's not actually true. You, you could be a mile away and still influence the escarpment. Now, escarpment is just a cliff. When you go to school and you get a degree, you got to use really long words, it's just a cliff. Down in Fond du Lac, they call it a ledge. Up in uh, Canada, they call it a cliff, A. Eh? And here we call it the escarpment. So wherever you live in this diagram, be aware that you're directly connected to your neighbor, not just by roads and not by paths through the forest, but by the rock and the soil itself. This connects us. This is, on, this is what we have built our homes on. This is where we found those great bays to be safe in the storms and be able to offload the, thing, the eggs down in Egg Harbor. You know, it's called Egg Harbor because I think there was an egg fight there, right? Because somebody tried to offload over at the escarpment and everything got messy. So they went into the bay and they said, okay, okay, okay. We'll just get them off here. So the thing is, this is history. This is geologic, natural history. And it defines why we live where we live. It also defines where the farmers farm. You know, how many of you are farmers? You know, he is. Well, that's telling. <laughs> I'm not either, by the way, but I play one on TV. <laughs> Anyways, if you've only got three inches of soil, you're going to have a hard go at farming. And a lot of the Door County soils are very, very, very thin. So I want to talk about sustainability in the escarpment a little bit. Sustainability. What is sustainability? Sustainability is a old term that has a thousand and one definitions. So we think of sustainability as the environment, and within that sphere is the community, and within that sphere is the economy of nature. So the application of quantifiable practices that include the economic, social, and environmental metrics that measure reductions in energy resource use, aggressive improvements in the environment and community while working towards a zero net total impact. That's what nature does. So we can model our activities after nature, and we can actually be sustainable. Some of us are trying very hard to do this, and some of us are not aware of it. The thing about sustainability, don't kick yourself if you haven't done it so far. Just look forward and see what you can do from now on. 
Understanding your history and why everything is like this is really important in that context. The thinness of the soils, by the way, is thinner now than when the settlers first came 150, 200 years ago because erosion has probably removed in some places 80% of the soil. When the First Nation people came up this peninsula, they did have areas where they planted and harvested crops. We see this all through the North American region, everywhere they went, incredibly well-adjusted and basically sustainable. There were some tribal practices, like uh, burning the prairies in southern Wisconsin, that actually changed those habitats significantly. But they really did get the sustainability down pretty well. And it all comes back to this. Now, uh, what's going to happen as we go forward in time? The neat thing about a historian is we can learn from history. Well, if we look at our water consumption, this is a map plotting the cone of depression, how much water is sucked out of the ground through the municipal wells in the cities. You're going to see a series of big blotches starting to develop. The one down in Chicago is going to end up being 850 feet below normal. That's how much water has been pulled out of that area. Milwaukee is almost 400 feet. Green Bay is almost 300 feet. And look, they're connecting. These aquifers are, in essence, permanently drained in our lifetimes, in your children's lifetimes, and their children's lifetimes. This is not a sustainable practice. In modeling climate change, we see that Wisconsin is going to be very much like you know, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas in the future, not so far away. And what that means is we're going to see hotter days. We're going to see actually up here in Door County, a little bit more rain, maybe an inch or two a year more. We're also going to have about another month of growing season. This is what's going to happen. We're going to have shorter winters. I think we'll still get the polar vortex. That's actually predicted in the model. The thing is, this is going to be a magnet for people. If you're living in Arizona and you're looking at the Great Lakes, Ephraim looks pretty good, right? So what's the population change here in Door County in the peninsula from a mega region like Chicago and Milwaukee? I'm a bit concerned that we could go from 30,000 people as a permanent resident population to 100,000 people as a permanent resident population by 2050. Think of the traffic jams on July 4th. <laughs> The thing is, these are the top issues that we're dealing with when we talk about care and feeding of our planet. The population, and the energy, and the water, and the food, and the environment, all of these things guide our ability to actually have sound human rights, democracy, and basic health care, and economic parity. If you get those things right, then the poverty, terrorism, war, and disease actually start fixing themselves because people are happy. They have a high quality of life. A lot of these things come out of, of this. Now, I didn't, I, don't, I didn't make this up. I lived in Africa for eight years, and I worked in 50, 60, 70 countries in the Northern Hemisphere and about 30 in the summer, Southern Hemisphere. And I learned it by seeing these cultures collapse in some places or boom in other cases. So through 90 countries visiting and working and living, this is what we see in terms of uh, the imperatives for happiness. You know. And so what we want to do is we want to think about sustainability and the Niagara Escarpment as a guidepost. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a canary in a coal mine. If that system out there looks healthy, then we know that we're, we're doing the right thing. If it looks like it's sick in places or being damaged, then we know things are a bit off. And so right now, we know that our things are a bit off because a lot of us that are doing ecology and geology and hydrology and restoration and land stewardship along those portions of the Door Peninsula, we see fewer species than we saw 50 years ago, and this is measured. We see more invasive species than we did even 10 or 20 years ago, and this is measured. And we see a profound change in the connectivity of the habitats, okay? So one of the things I want you to think about as you think about, and this is a historical thing, because a lot of this is based on nature, 
and how the First Nation people were stewards of their land, and how we have to relearn this again. Most farmers have an intuitive sense for this. If you grew up in a city, you gotta probably learn it, but you have an intuitive sense for the city. See? All of these things are valuable, by the way. None of them are bad. But we wanna look at a holistic planning system of how we treat our environment. The house you live in, the land you reside on, and so part of it is making a, a sustainable land use plan, okay? And you can do this at any stage in your life to any degree that you can afford or any degree you feel like doing it. For instance, if we build a nature center on the escarpment, we should be very aware that we have to do a minimal impact of area. So there's a thing called a green field where you build on land that's never been built on or a brown field where there might be an existing building. You would choose the brown field. That's a sustainable practice, okay? We would use renewable energies as much as possible and as much as affordable rather than the fossil fuels, which we know have profound limits, okay? That leads to interpreting the land. This is where we learn, this is what this group is doing. You guys get it. You understand the history. This is an integral part of sustainability. How are we going to look at the land and our community and our connectivity? The environment has all of the sciences and engineering, even the arts and math and everything to understand how the world works. The community is all of us, our, our happiness, our belief systems, our socializations, all the diversity that we have. And that is our history. And then inside of that is the natural economy. And the real economy from macro to microeconomics to do I have a job in the summer, okay? That's part of it. And so we go from the land use, the interpretive stuff, down to are you gonna build something or repurpose an existing building? So one of the things, what I love about here, is this building is used for everything. I've held concerts in here, we've had little science gatherings in here, your historical foundation meets here. Look at all the ways this is utilized, okay? And so all of that comes together through the land stewardship and the learning and then the built spaces plan so that we can actually put, this, put, put our activities through the sustainability filter. And the reason we want to measure this is we want to be able to say we are minimizing the impact to the world through these things. So sustainability is something that I learned in geology, okay? By working around the world, I'm not particularly clever, so it was kind of like, oh, yeah. I better pay attention to how much, uh, how many rare earth elements we have in the planet. Why? Because I have a cell phone or I have a lot of electronics, and all these things go into that. How about nickel? You can't fly a plane without nickel. Who went on an aircraft this past year? <laughs> really, only a third of you? <laughs> Come on. My carbon footprint's horrible because I fly all the time, okay? The thing is, can you imagine if you had to pay fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for a flight from Milwaukee to Seattle? You know, if you can't get all that stuff to build these things, then we have goofed up on sustainability. So the natural history of this land here teaches us those things. So thanks very much. I hope that we have one of the in, what's the best guess of water levels in the Great Lakes? Well, first of all, it's already kicked in. It kicked in, um, we kind of put the new geologic era called the Anthropocene, which is the first geologic period where a species has altered the ecosystems of the planet. And day one for that is 1610, Industrial Revolution. Now, this is measured because we can measure the CO2 in the atmosphere and watch it correlate directly with how much coal was being burned since then in the ice cores in Greenland, for instance. 
and in the last 200 years from direct atmosphere measurements. So it's already here and it's already happening. Now the Great Lakes have a regular natural cycle of seven to 10 years of about a three foot swing. So uh, I know one gentleman who uh, bought his property when the water was low and then the property came up, the, the water level came up three feet. Remember when you could walk all the way out halfway across the harbor right here, just how many years ago? Five years ago, right? There's grass growing out there, they're digging ditches, they're trying to get boats in here, all of that stuff. That was a normal thing. So what we're seeing with, with the measurements of the lake is we're seeing the highs and the lows and the highs and the lows. And what they're doing through time is they're still doing that fluctuation, which is natural, but they're also just dropping a little bit, okay? Now, we don't know if that's due to water use, climate change, or something else, like trying to recharge these aquifers we've drained, which we don't really know how well they're connected under the lake, or a combination of all of them, okay? So we have this challenge, that's my MacBook, uh, we have this challenge that uh, um, we measure thousands and thousands of things, but the Earth is an open system. There's tens of thousands or millions of things <coughs> impinging on this. So in the global warming models, we've got it whittled down to about 30, 40 really important things, and we have seven dominant models we use. And I've been studying this process for about 35 years. And uh, the models, when you look at the data, you build a model, and then you do a thing called backcasting. So you go back in time, 100 years, and then you run the data that you have to see if you get what we're seeing today. If you don't, your model is wrong. And they went through a lot of wrong models, okay? This is why for you know, the 50s and 60s and 70s, you didn't hear about this stuff. They were developing the models. So it's these models that we can use to answer your question. What's gonna happen to the Great Lakes? My biggest concern is people. <coughs> right now we have 7.2 billion people on the planet. By 2050, we're gonna have 9.1 billion people on the planet. And by the end of the century, we could be up in the 10 to 11 billion people on the planet if something really bad doesn't happen. They're gonna get really thirsty. There's already plans that have been drawn up to take Great Lakes water, in particular Lake Michigan water, all the way to Arizona. So the lake levels are going to be a function of natural processes and our own activities. So if we really behave well and conserve and stuff like that, the lake level will really struggle along, you know, like this. Now we're gonna have more rain up here in the next, with, with what's happening, but it's also gonna be hotter. We get most of our evaporation in the winter on the Great Lakes because the air has less moisture in it. So it can take more off the lake. So if we have shorter winters, we actually lose more water. And that can have a profound level on the lakes. Okay, so it, it's, it's people, water use, and a gradual drop. In our lifetime, my lifetime, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years old and looking forward to all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, I've already seen the level, lake level fluctuate as much as four feet. All right, that guy, by the way, uh, built a house and then uh, when the uh, next uh, low water stand went, he said, I thought I was on the beach and he had, you know, he had to go like 40, 50 feet out to the water. And he, he said, somebody should do something about this. So we're doing something about that. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. You kind of a lot. follow up. Um, melting ice caps, do they have any impact on the Great Lakes? We are about 300 feet above sea level. So unless, the sea level rises 350 feet, 400 feet, no. So, uh, and that's a great question, by the way, because many, many people have said, oh my God, I'd better, you know, I'd, I'd better move to the middle of the peninsula <laughs> because we're gonna have, you know, sea level rise. This is a lake, not the sea. Uh, but we're gonna see potentially drops in the lake. Yeah. What is the rebound effect and how much is it each year in the glacier? Mm -hmm. And how do you measure it? Uh, what what uh, the question is, is what is the rebound effect? That's a reference to isostasy. 
And what uh, we're talking about here is when there was a mile thickness of ice, that's heavy. And that actually pushed the crust of the Earth down here as much as three to 400 feet. When that ice melts back, it rebounds. So in the first thousand years, you get rebounds like several feet a year in places. And this is measured by looking at old lake levels. Okay, so you'll see you know, what looks like a deeper lake further south where the rebound has been greater and a shallower lake in the north, but actually it's like a, a wedge. The north part is going up this fast, but the south part is going up faster, so it goes like this, see? Kind of like a wing. And um, so we can measure that by looking at the age of the beaches with carbon isotope dating. We can look at the geologic uh, nature of the beach and the species and, and so on and so forth. And this has been studied by thousands of theses. Right now, the north end of Lake Michigan still goes up a fraction of a, a less than a millimeter to two millimeters a year, less, less than a millimeter a year. And down in Chicago, it's very, very quiet. Well, not on a Friday night, but the rest <laughs> of the week is, is pretty much. So, but what we see is a very rapid rebound when the ice first goes away, and then it just slows down. Now, the thing about glaciologists is they're all stark raving mad. And there's a reason for this. They're insane. They can't help it. You know, you ever, anybody know a glaciologist? <laughs> Stay away from them. <laughs> I mean, isosity, the, the land is doing <coughs> this, right? The lake level is doing this, right? Can you stand up a second here? Yeah, it's okay. And just stand up and hold your arms up and, and do this. There you go, okay. So what's your name? Claire. Claire is doing the isosceles and the water levels. Keep doing it. Now the ice is.